Okay, hello everybody and welcome back to uh, webinar number three in Practical AI for Non-Coders. Uh, this lecture will be on training and deploying artificial intelligences. We are joined by the wonderful Luca Ewington Pitsos, uh, who has been your uh, mentor for the past couple of weeks and will be for the next two weeks. We are also joined on the back end by the wonderful Kit uh, from ITM, who is making sure everything runs smoothly and has helped iron out several technical difficulties already in the evening. So she's really, uh, you know, working hard for everybody. My name is Jack. I am your MC for the evening and a uh, assessments and uh, what's it called? Enrollment. I know that <laughs> uh, person at ITM in general. Uh, and as usual, we would like to acknowledge that we are coming to you today from the uh, Wurundjeri, uh, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation uh, and acknowledge their unceded sovereignty and acknowledge their uh, ongoing connections to lands, waters and culture, pay respects to their elders and ancestors. Uh, this is, as I said, a short course, the third in a series of four on practical AI for non-coders by IT Masters and Charles Sturt University. Uh, as usual, if you complete this short course as well as uh, two additional short courses, you can get uh, one subject worth of course credit for some of our full length subjects, uh, full length uh, courses, the so graduate certificates, masters, et cetera, which we'll talk a little bit more about towards the end. And um, we'll drop some information in the chat about uh, some more IT masters information further down the line. Uh, but for now, just a tiny bit of housekeeping. In the chat, feel free to put your observations, uh, your general uh, notes on the course, anything that you'd like to uh, say to everybody. You can set your chat settings to down the bottom, uh, sending messages to everyone rather than just hosts and panelists. Uh, Q&A section, we would like to keep that for questions that are directly for you, Luca, about the course content, the, uh, about the course content itself. Uh, so please keep those uh, topical. Again, as usual, we will not be able to answer everybody's questions all the time, but you are very welcome and in fact encouraged to make your way after the webinar to the student forums at learn.itmasters.edu.au and hopefully have a robust discussion with each other and with Luca about the content that is covered in a much more um, substantial kind of way. Mm. Uh, and we really want you to do that. And learn.itmasters.edu.au is also where you can find uh, all of the course materials. So recordings from all the webinars, uh, mm. readings, additional information, as well as those forums. You can find that all mm. at learn.itmasters.edu.au. And without any further ado, there's been far too much to do already. Here's <laughs> Luca Ewington Pizzas. Thank you very much, Jack. Very kind introduction as always. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm self-taught AI guy, now working as a data scientist in Australia. Um, I've run two startups before with varying levels of AI stuff in them. So my background is very industry kind of focused. I'm not like as much of an academics guy, I'm more of an industry guy. Now I just want to take a very quick poll before we start. Can everyone put like a, say something in the chat if you've actually completed any of the tests that I've been like making really painstakingly? Yes, okay, nice. That is so good to hear. Excellent, excellent. Okay, that's good. It's okay, nice. Because I do put a lot of effort into those tests and I think they're very informative and they, they really help you like, you know, sort of ingrain the knowledge that you're getting. So that's, that's really good to hear. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, okay, cool, excellent. That's really good to hear. And with that boost to my motivation, let's go. This is going to be the most fun lecture so far because we're talking about training and deploying artificial intelligences. Um, so this is like getting to the practical end of the stick. And um, as always, the course objective here is that everyone here will learn enough about AI to be dangerous. Um, you'll be able to look at a task and work out if AI can feasibly perform that task and also the resources required um, to perform it with AI. So that's the objective. You'll be able to think about how to solve tasks with AI. Um, and so if you want to learn that, one of the important things is to do the tests because the tests are like, they'll help you learn that really well. Okay, so last week we talked about um, 
using AI to solve a particular task and we chose an artificially intelligent face recognition system. So we're gonna recap that this lecture. And after that, after we finish recapping, talking about um, the task description, inputs and outputs with our three-part model, architecture and parameters. Next, we're gonna go on to testing, which is a really, really big, really important thing that if anyone knows any data scientists, um, they'll know that they're always talking about testing. Um, testing, why testing is so important. We're gonna talk about domain shift. We're gonna talk about training and training data. And we're gonna talk about overfitting. And then finally, we're gonna talk about deployment. So these are all the big words that you hear all the time in data scientists, science, and when people are talking about AI. So this is gonna be a really like, this is gonna be a really like rich one. And then by the end of this lecture, you'll have a really good idea um, about what's going on. Okay, so just before we start, the next lecture, we're gonna kind of repeat this process going from a task description all the way to deployment, except you guys get to pick what the task is. So if you go over to the Moodle forum, I've made a post here and I'll ask for some suggestions about what the task should be in the next lecture. Um, and we've already got some good suggestions over here. You, if you have time, you know, you make a suggestion and maybe your suggestion will be the one that we're going with. The one that I like so far is the one by Andrew Clements over here, summary AI document writer. Um, so we might try to try to define that task, define the inputs and the outputs, you know, find some architecture, and then actually work out what we need to do to build this artificial AI system. And then if you want, as a practice, you can do it for other suggestions that people have. But yeah, so feel free to make suggestions on the Moodle. Um, and I'll read them and then we'll make one of them next time. The dog suggestion did not seem doable, Dave. The dog suggestion is build a like literal AI dog. That's so hard. There's like a million things involved in that. There's no way that's doable. Anyway, okay. So let's actually get to the content. Let's get to the content. So last time we talked about how we could build an AI door lock system. Jack, just before I go on, can I, can I have the chat sitting here? Or is that like, is that no bueno? Can you have the, the what, sorry? The chat. Is it okay? The, the chat. chat. Can the chat live down here somewhere? Uh, I don't think that we can see your chat. Really? On the screen? I, said, can't, I, can't, I can't see the chat. Oh, my God. Really? No. Oh. You can put it wherever <laughs> you like. <laughs> I wanted people to be able to see the chat. Okay, okay, okay. Well, that's fine. Well, we'll do it next time. Okay. Wait, someone says they can see it, but they're probably lying to just fool us. Okay. Anyhow. I think they can probably see their own chat. Everyone can see the chat. Ah, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay, so last lesson, we talked about designing a door lock that opens to only people who have red hair. So I don't know, maybe we've been hired by like the Illuminati, the red hair Illuminati. They've got a secret hideout and on the hideout is a camera, which is pointed above the door. And the camera is hooked up to a computer. So it sends the images that it takes, the video it takes into the computer. It takes like, let's say, you know, three pictures a second. And the computer, um, we're going to build some sort of artificial intelligence system on it. And the computer will tell a door lock to unlock or lock, depending on if they can see someone with red hair. So that was the, the, the task we were trying to solve last time. I'm sure everyone remembers that. People can remember that. Um, yeah. Uh, blip, blip, blip. And of course, the last thing we did, yep, people in the chat are saying they remember it. That's very good to hear. Uh, last thing we did is we applied the three-part model to this situation. So we were like, okay, what's the input? Well, the input is images from the camera. And what's the output? The output is like yes or no. The output is unlock or don't unlock. It's like a binary. We call that binary. You don't need to remember that word. It's just a word that'll make you sound really smart. It's binary, yes or no. And the architecture, in this case, we have to choose the architecture. But yeah, so inputs, outputs, architecture. Um, and yeah, so again, this is just the same information here. An image, this might be an example of an image, outcomes, yes, no. And then we did a bit of research and we found out that efficient net um, is a reasonable architecture. There's a video here that you can watch to learn a bit more about efficient net, but it's a bit technical. Anyway, efficient net is just a kind of machine learning model. Okay, so that's kind of where we were last time. Um, is anyone sort of unclear? Jack, are we unclear at the moment? Do you think there's more explanation that needs to be done? I think that's very good. 
Thank you, Jack. You're always, you're always so polite. Oh, um, I try. <laughs> okay, so now we're just going to talk about the sort of first bit of new content in this lecture. EfficientNet is an artificial neural network, which is a word that should be familiar to you by now. And an artificial neural network is just a specific technology that a lot of modern deep learning systems are built off of. And the sort of the key to this technology is that you, you shouldn't try to learn it because it's really complicated and you should just let it, let it, let, let yourself just have a vague notion of how it works. Don't try to get into the weeds here, but essentially it works by having lots of different nodes and all the nodes are connected to other nodes until you get this sort of network structure, like what you can see on the screen. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a pretty good way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is that in, inside our brains, we have these things called neurons. And this is sort of how, how human brains work, is they have these things called neurons, which have like a, an in bit and an out bit. The in bit picks up signals and sends it over to the out bit. And our brains are just composed of you know, millions of these things all hooked together in a big network. And that's sort of where the idea of an artificial neural network comes from. It's they're trying to sort of simulate these neurons that we have in our brain, but try to make a try to make them out of like computer parts. So that's and software. That's what um, that's what an artificial neural network is. And I guess just getting a little bit more specific about artificial neural networks, you could. Another way of picturing is them like this. So you have like an input layer and you, you add something to the input. So this is where you'd pass the image. And you have a lot of hidden layers of these neurons in the middle. And the hidden layers are connected to the input layers. And the hidden layers also connect to the output layers. So in this network, there's like what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 14, 15, 16. there's like 17 neurons in this neural network and they're all sort of connected to each other. And in this one, this is obviously a bit of a bigger neural network. It has a lot more neurons, it's got another 18 neurons. And this is kind of how neural networks look and how they work. They've got an input, they've got a lot of hidden layers where everything's all connected together. And then finally you get an output, which is in some way related to what came in. Um, and this is, the terminology for today, or what one of the two big terminologies for today, parameters are another name for neurons. Um, and the reason we call them parameters is because each neuron contains its own special number. And the number dictates basically how much influence these neurons have on these neurons. So if the number is really high, these neurons will affect these neurons. If it's really low, there won't be anything passing through here. And so that's why they call them parameters. They all contain one number. And again, this is going deeper than you need to go really to understand neural networks. But just focus on these two basic facts. Firstly, the more parameters in a neural network, the more neurons in a neural network, the bigger the network is. So that's, that should be pretty obvious. It should be easy to see. This one has less parameters, it's smaller. This one has more parameters, it's bigger. This one has even more parameters, it's even bigger than that. The second basic fact is that the more, um, the more neurons in a neural network, the bigger a network is, the more powerful it is. So small networks are usually good for simple tasks. They train really quick. They're really quick to build. They, they run really fast. Big net networks are they're slower to run. They take longer to train, but they can perform more complex and difficult tasks. So for instance, um, a neural network, a simple neural network to recognize a digit that's drawn on a piece of paper, um, for, you know, on a, on a white image, that would be a smaller one. Something to drive a self-driving car, that would be huge. That would be immense. Chat GPT, it's huge. It's very big. It has heaps and heaps of parameters. Okay, so that's parameters. And we kind of see this when we look at efficient net. So when the guys built efficient net, they built like seven different kinds of efficient net, all based on the same kind of blueprint. And as you can see here, each, each version has a set separate number of parameters. Um, B0 has 5.3 million, 
B6 has 43 million, so they get more and more and more. Um, back in the day, this was considered a pretty big neural network. Now we're talking about billions of parameters. Some of the big large language models have like 70 billion parameters, and that's, that's considered a big neural network these days. Um, and you'll be able to see something. Uh, type in the chat, okay, what's, what's happening here? What's happening here? As the neural networks get better, bigger, what happens, what happens to the accuracy? Um, and Jack, if, if you want to act as the voice of the chat here and have a guess. Uh, everyone is saying it increases or <laughs> improves, which is also what I would have said. Nice. Well, you're all very clever and right and smart. And, and because that's the answer. So as we can see, basically, as there are more parameters, the neural network gets more accurate. And of course, these neural networks were trained for ages, but that's sort of the relationship. Bigger neural networks, more parameters, more accurate. Okay, so hopefully that's all clear. Everyone's having a good time. Um, maybe we should take a break for questions. Sure, why not? Well, we've got a couple of questions. We've got a lot of questions about the neural networks, mm. uh, which I will wade through a little bit. Mm. Uh, so Fabio has asked if a neuron is a decision point, i.e. if then, else. Kind of. Yes, sort of. You can think of it like that. So for instance, let's, we're getting deeper than we need to. Okay, guys, so don't turn your brains off for a second. Just let this information waft over you. Don't think about it too hard. Let's say we were trying to detect if the top, we pass in, how much? One, two, three, four, five, six. We pass in six numbers. We want to work out if this first number is, is a one, okay? Uh, and the numbers can either be one or zero. So we want to work out if the first number is a one, we don't care about all the others. Now, we could have a neural network that this, <laughs> the thing is each number, the way it works is each number gets multiplied against the next neuron. And then the output of that gets multiplied against the next neuron and the output of that gets multiplied against the next neuron. So the idea is that if you have one, one and one here, then you have your input here. It's one, five zeros times one, times one, times one. The output is Jack. Sorry, I was reading the questions. <laughs> Sorry. I, I did not hear the question. Oh my gosh, I'm having flashbacks to high school. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. The, the output is one in this case. And if it's a zero, uh, one zero times one, which is zero times one, which is zero times one, which is zero, the output is zero. Um, and you can see how like, you can, you can kind of use these layers as decision points. If there's zero, the signal gets through. If there's zero, the signal gets stopped. If they're one, it gets through. If they're 0 0.7, it only gets through a little bit. So in that way, you can kind of think of them as if there's sort of a little bit, but like I'm just scratching the surface here. I'm not doing a very good job of explaining this. And it's because it's really complicated to explain. Um, I'm gonna show at the end of this lecture, I'm gonna link you to a video that does a really good job of explaining these, okay? Three blue, one brown. He did an excellent job. In fact, I'm gonna bring that up right now. Um, here we go. It's this one here. It's really, 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 really good. I'm gonna post it in the chat and watch this afterwards, guys, because it's really, really good and it'll explain way better than me, but it'll take a while, that's all. And it, it contains maths. That was a long answer to the question. <laughs> I'll try to be short on the next one. All good. Uh, we've got, oh, this is an interesting question. Kevin asks, if the neural network is an abstraction to understand something uh, built in software, i.e. a lot of software, or is it also represented in silicon also? It is only software. It is not silicon, except for some crazy, insane researchers who are trying to build like these weird neural brain things. So basically all software. Good question. That is a great question. I'm very interested in the hypothetical brain of Theseus. <laughs> uh, okay, how much depth are we covering in this hypothetical door lock system? Do we have to cover variables such as lighting conditions, hats, wigs, possible dyed hair, et cetera, or is it the best case scenario of perfect lighting and people without hats or wigs? Who asked that? Who asked that? Who was Dave, that? it's Dave. Dave. Dave, you legend. You would make an excellent data science, Dave. I don't know what your current career is, but it's the wrong one. <laughs> you need to take up data science. This is an excellent question to ask. 
This is a question that you always have to be asking yourself. It is the most important kind of question to ask. How much depth are we covering in this system? Um, and the answer is we're covering all of it. And so it, I'm really glad you're thinking along those lines. Everyone should be. That's a great question. Fantastic. Shall we jump back into the content itself just for time reasons? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Um, we can't top that question, I don't think. You'll, you'll, you'll have trouble topping that question, Chad. That was a sick question. Okay, so again, here we are. Three-part model, image comes in, give it to efficient net, out comes in, out, uh, yes, no. And efficient net is sitting here on this computer. So the image comes in like three times a second. And each time efficient net says yes or no. And then if it's yes, unlocks the door, no, it keeps the door locked. Okay, so that's the recap completely over. Now we're gonna talk about designing tests. And testing, tests is a word that comes up a lot in data science. Um, that's, yeah. Okay, but before we talk too much about testing, um, or at least before we talk about testing artificial intelligences, let's talk about testing um, biological intelligences. So there's this trick that you can teach dogs, and I went past this again, but I'm gonna keep going past it because it's such a good example. There's this trick you can teach dogs where they'll, they'll take a, where you, you teach them to put their snout on your hand like this. And that, that's called targeting. This dog has learned how to do targeting. He's taught it how to do targeting. He's currently teaching it how to do targeting a bit more. And there we go, the dog is doing targeting. Okay, we're gonna come back to this video a lot. This is an important video. Um, and the basic way that you train a dog is you introduce a stimulus, you put your hand out, you put your fist out, dog puts its snout on the fist. And if it does the right thing, you reward it. And if it does something else, you don't reward it. So this is how you teach a dog targeting. And this is sort of a general model for teaching behavior to non-artificial intelligences, just regular old intelligences, is that you introduce a stimulus and then you reward behavior if it's good and only if it's good. And of course, you can sort of apply the three-part model. We did this last time to the situation. You have the input, which is the stimulus. You have the architecture, which is the dog and you have the output, which is what the dog does in response. So where it puts its snout. And a nice little fun thing to think about is that you know, if you wanna teach targeting, there are a few different dog architectures that you could try. And some dog architectures will work better than others. We've done all this before. Obviously this maps quite nicely to what we're doing, except with different inputs, outputs, and a different architecture. Okay. Um, and now we're going to talk about testing. And we're going to talk about designing a test for a biological intelligence. So let's say that you have a dog and it's really important for you that this dog learns how to do targeting. And you've hired the best possible dog trainer on earth. You've hired Ian Dunbar. Okay, he's, I don't know, he's one of the best. I don't want to get into the dog trainer drama. He's good. <laughs> you've hired Ian Dunbar and you said, teach my dog targeting. Ian's gonna go off, he's gonna teach your dog. But before he does that, you have to find, before he even does that, you have to design a test so that when you get your dog back, you'll be able to test the dog to work out if Ian Dunbar has trained your dog correctly. So in the chat, give some ideas. What, what, what kind of test could you do to work out if your dog has been taught targeting correctly? when your dog comes back. And someone's pointed out Skinner stimulus response. And the thing that we're trying to teach our dog is we're trying to teach, there we go. Okay, everyone gave a lot of different answers, which kind of shows that I haven't been very clear. But the thing is, Ian Dunbar has gone off to teach your dog a specific trick. Ian Dunbar has gone off to teach your dog how to do targeting, which is this, this thing, right? Well, you put out your hand and the dog puts its snout on your hand. That's targeting. And Ian Dunbar's gone off to try to teach your dog how to do targeting. Um, and your vet answered correctly. How do you test? How do you test if the dog has been trained correctly? You just put out your hand and you see what the dog does. And if the dog doesn't put its snout on your hand, then you know, ah, okay, 
Ian Dunbar has done a bad job. My dog hasn't learned how to do targeting. Does that make sense to everyone? Can I get a sense of if that makes sense in the chat? Say no if it doesn't. I'm getting lots of yeses. That's good. Great. I'm getting a lot of yeses. There's a nerd face. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Great. So that's one way you could test. That's We've just designed a test for a non-artificial intelligence. Now, I want to ask you a more tricky question. What if you really need to be sure that your dog knows how to do targeting? What if like your life depends on your dog knowing targeting and it has to be able to target in all kinds of different conditions? You know, no matter what, it has to know really well. How could you make this test a bit harder and make it a bit, a bit more difficult and give you more certainty when the dog passes? There we go. There we go. Someone got it. Amazing. The chat's moving so fast, I can't find the damn thing that someone said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Na NASA. NASA said, test 50 times in different situations. Exactly. So rather than just testing once, see if the dog does it correctly, you test it 10 times. And then let's say you test it inside, you test it outside, you test it on a busy street, you test it in a lake, you test it on a mountaintop. You do all those tests 10 times each, and if the dog targets every single time, okay, your dog has learned targeting, Ian Dunbar gets his cash, his cash reward. So this is what we call testing. And this is what we have to do with artificial intelligences, is before we start, we have to design a test to work out if the artificial intelligence has, has learned correctly. Um, so this is, this is an example of how you would test a dog, right? Um, you give it the input, the stimulus, and you give it that input under a wide variety of conditions. And each time, if every time you give it the input, the architecture gives you the correct output under all those conditions, in the rain, in the snow, under the water, every time the dog targets correctly, it gives you the correct output, then you know you've, you've, you've tested it and it's passed and you know the dog has learned the behavior. And similarly, we want to design a similar test for our neural network so that we'll, we'll, we'll go off, we'll train it, and then we'll get it to pass this test. We'll keep giving it inputs. And if it gets the output right every time, okay, now we know we're confident in its abilities. And just a little short you know, aside, why do we design tests? Why do we do that? What's the point of designing tests? Well, firstly, because if you have a neural network that you build and deploy into production and it doesn't work, the consequences can be very serious. Like imagine, in fact, I'll ask chat, let's ask chat. What are some examples of some very serious things that could go wrong if a neural network was not tested and was just thrown out there before we were sure that it had learned? Uh, crash self-driving Tesla. There we the go. The first, uh, first one that I'm seeing, yes. There we go. Yeah, so people, people we, we, we are trusting these kind of intelligences to, to drive cars for us. And you better be bloody sure that these intelligences are correct in the outputs they're giving if we're putting them behind the wheel of a car. Someone said, delivery drone drops my pizza, says Brad, which is, which would also be, that would also be a terrible consequence. Can I get Fs, Fs in the chat for Brad's pizza dropped by the delivery drone? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. I appreciate that. I'm sure Brad appreciates our, our um, commiseration. But yes, so uh, self-driving cars, that's obviously a good example. You know, sometimes we have these machine learning models giving predictions for diseases like cancer, and that's obviously very, very serious as well. So the thing is, if we put it out there in the real world before testing it, we don't know what the hell it's going to do. We can't trust it. Okay, and the other thing is data science is really, is really hard. As a data scientist, as someone who's done a lot of data science projects, like it's really difficult. Pretty much only, only Dave, only Dave is, is clever enough to be a data scientist. I'm barely clever enough. A lot of people, okay, that, that's a bad way of saying it. Actually, everyone could do it. It's just that it's very hard. Um, everyone's clever enough. It's just that it really takes a lot of concentration and I often don't have the kind of concentration you need. Um, so it's really important when you're doing data science is to be clear on exactly what you're trying to build, what you're aiming for. You know, to sort of keep, you know, make a make a make an endpoint, have like a mountain in the distance you're aiming for, 
so that when you walk through the jungle, you don't get lost. Um, and this is speaking from bitter experience. So what you do is you design a test that you're going to pass at the very end. You're like, okay, if we pass that test, we're fine. And then you have that to always look towards. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, should we have a stop for questions, you think? Jack, thoughts? Uh, sure, but I'm going to limit it to two questions because we don't have a huge amount of time. We've got a lot of content. Okay. So, I've got a question uh, that keeps coming up, so I'm going to ask it. Ben wants to know how much a human designer has to define the structure of the model to begin with. And is it possible to take a blank model and train it to do something? Um, okay, I'll give you an example of what is possible. You can take uh, a model that has been taught to classify images into different classes. So it takes in an image and its output is, I don't know, like a, like a, in fact, even better, its output is either one or zero. So it takes an image, outputs yes or no, just like the model that we have here. And you could train it to recognize redhead people. You could train it to recognize birds. You could train it to recognize trees. You could train it to recognize cattle. So in a way, you kind of have a blank network. You know, you can use this same structure to always um, to do a lot of different things. But you couldn't use the same network to, I don't know, um, you couldn't use it to classify an image into one of a hundred different classes because all it outputs is yes or no. You have to build a different model that can do the classification. You can't teach it to draw bounding boxes in images. You can't teach it to um, generate images like stable diffusion does. You can't teach it to generate text like chat GPT. So you have to build a model for a specific situation. But if you've built a model that's broad enough, you, there are a bunch of situations that model can be applied to. Hopefully that makes sense. There's not like one model to rule them all or anything like that. That's good to know. Uh, and uh, we have a few questions about tests, but I think I might just let you continue on with, uh, with tests. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. So um, how do we test? We've already talked about how we could test our biological intelligence, test if the dog knows targeting. We just test it 10 times under very different conditions. Here's an example of how we could test our model. So let's say we have a similar situation. We have defined a task right now. And then Andre Karpathy, who's one of the best data scientists on earth, or at least one of the most well-known, he seems to be very good at his job. Um, he's offered to train our model for us. So he's going to go off and train it. But before he does, we need to design a test so that when it comes back to us, we'll be able to tell if it's good enough or not. So here's one example of a test that we could do. We get, a, we get our model back from Andre, and then we just put the model straight into production. We plonk it here into this computer, and maybe we also have a human to stand by to make sure that you know, nothing goes wrong. So the human's standing there as well to correct the model and lock the door if it needs to. And we just wait a month. And if after a month it seems to be doing a good job, we go, okay, the model's trained. So, what is a good thing? Let's ask the chat. What is a good thing about this? And what is, what is a bad thing about, about this as a testing strategy? In fact, let's start with a bad thing. What is one bad thing about this as a testing strategy? Time consumption. Beautiful. Kusalia. Nice. Every, ah, everyone's getting it. Excellent. It takes a bloody month with our dog. We just had to take it outside a few times. You know, it probably took like 10 minutes. You know, if we're being really stringent, we took it for a walk around the park or whatever. It took like three hours. This takes a month. You have to wait a whole month before you can draw a conclusion about this model. That sucks. You're also paying someone to stand there and second guess the model. It sucks. That's bad. The other thing is you might not even, you might not even get your answer. Maybe you use it for a month and maybe like the secret, you know, cabal of redheads only meets like once every two months. So you stick it in there and you know, it doesn't even really see combat. It only sees like random office people coming in that every now and then. It doesn't even get to do one full meeting. So a month is a huge amount of time and you might not also, it also might not be representative. Um, 
So that's, that's one bad thing about this strategy. Can someone think in the chat of a better, what's a better way of testing this model? What's a better test that we could do? This is a hard question. It's gonna require a bit of, a bit of, a bit of bloody typing. Use it 450 times, I like that. That's good. Be a bit more specific though, because like use it 450 times could mean a few things. Feed it thousands of internet photos, Adam G, legend. So that's one potential thing we could do. So we could download from the internet. Thank you very much, Adam. Download from the internet, lots and lots of pictures of redhead people. Let's like, take celebrities because there's tons of pictures of celebrities. So um, show it lots of pictures of celebrities with red hair, show it lots of non-red hair celebrities and then see how many it gets right and see how many it gets wrong. And ideally, like you should make it, it should get none wrong. Okay, so what is good about this? What's good about this strategy? Why is it good? More data points, yep, great. Oh, sorry, what were you gonna say, Jack? I was gonna say, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say it gives you a lot of data that you can use. Yes. So the thing is, for a month, maybe it'll see like 200 people. This way, we can give it every celebrity ever. We can show it like a thousand different people. So if it, if we show it a thousand different people and it gets them all right, then we can be pretty confident that, you know, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty done a thousand people. We can, we can show it a million people. Um, the issue here is that celebrity pictures, they look a certain way. You know, they're all sort of taken with pretty good lighting. They kind of usually look like this picture, but we're talking about a camera, right? We're talking about a camera that's sitting on a door. I don't know, like the pictures that it gives is probably gonna look a bit more like what's on the, on the right, <laughs> right? It's gonna be a bit blurry, maybe a bit desaturated. The people are gonna be off in the distance. So you could imagine that you could train a model to recognize images like this and classify them really well, but when you showed it images like this, it would fail. So that's one issue with getting pictures of celebrities from online. That's one issue with this second test. The benefit, of course, is that you can show it thousands of celebrities, and also it's really fast. You know, you set this up on a computer to do the testing, you shove in all the images, it'll take like half a minute, maybe a minute, I don't know, it depends. Um, and by the way, this, this, by the way, is called domain shift. Um, this is a pretty fancy machine learning word. So um, um, if you use it, basically people will think you're a genius. You know, if you're talking to a data scientist and you say, oh yeah, have you considered domain shift? They'll be like, wow. So yeah, so uh, consider that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so domain shift is when the data that the model had to deal with in production is different from the data it had to deal with in testing or training. Okay. Um, now there's another test that we're going to try. How about rather than pictures from celebrities online, we showed a thousand images of redhead people taken with the same camera or a similar camera and a thousand non-redhead people and it isn't allowed to make any errors. It has to get all of them right. And only if it gets no errors, are you like, okay, it's passed its test, we can put it into production. Do we think this is, this is a pretty good test or not a good test? What do we think, guys? Ooh, people are saying no. People are saying no. Everyone's saying basic. Why is everyone saying no? What's wrong with this test? Look at <laughs> your basic. <laughs> I'm basic. That's so mean. <laughs> Zero errors might be too restrictive. It can be better, no way. Damn, okay. Well, Jack, I don't know what to say. The people are roasting me really hard. <laughs> you really opened yourself up to it. I'm so sorry. I got nothing else to say to you about that. I think you're about, I have a feeling you're about to tell us how it could be improved though. So redemption is within your grasp. <laughs> you might think so, Jack, but the next slide is like, this is the next slide. <laughs> this was my final answer. <laughs> In my opinion, this is a pretty reasonable test. Obviously, you know, people have been saying we can make it better. Maybe we can allow it more images. Maybe we can say um, it gets 100,000 images of each kind. 
Um, people have been saying maybe allow a little bit of leeway. Okay, maybe, maybe no errors is too restrictive. Maybe it'll only allow to make like a few errors, like three or four errors. But it depends. You know, if a thousand people rock up, you don't want it to let any non-redheads in. You want it to, to always be right. You don't want it to be, you know, it'll see about a thousand people every year. You don't want it to let one person in every year. That, that's, that sucks. You may as well just have a human at that point, you know. Um, but you're right, we could definitely add more images. The issue with adding more images is, it seems like in this case, we're gonna have to pay someone to go and, and sort of walk the streets and take pictures of people. Like, where are, you, where are we gonna get this testing data from? A thousand is a lot. 10,000 is, is a lot. 10,000 is a hell of a lot. So ideally you want tons and tons of images. Ideally you want really, really low error rates, um, but things do start getting expensive. Someone said AI generated images of people, which is an interesting thing that you could do. Um, that's something called synthetic data. That's something people try to do. Synthetic data. It's a big thing. Um, it's been a big thing for a while. Often it doesn't work very well, just in practice. It doesn't seem to work very well, synthetic data. It's pretty hard to get it right. Um, but it is definitely something you could try. The nice thing about synthetic data is it's very, very, very cheap. Okay, so these are some examples of tests. I think the last test is actually pretty good, despite the, the roasting that I just received. Okay, so now we've done testing. We've done testing. It's time for training. Are you excited for training, Jack? Yes, Jack? yes, I am. <laughs> so excited I couldn't find my unmute button. <laughs> that does, you know, training does that to people. It, it just paralyzes you with how cool it is. I know. Um, okay, so we talked about this very briefly last lesson, and you guys are always gonna, gonna wanna know more details. So I'm gonna be handling a lot of questions after this, I know. But very, very high level, training data is used to reward the model, reward in big quotes, for giving correct output, and punish, again in big quotes, the model for giving the wrong output. The maths, if you want to know about the maths, is there. If you watch that video I posted earlier, it goes into it. Um, but that's the very high level concept. And if you're someone who isn't an AI practitioner, you just need to know about how it works roughly so you can design these systems and talk about these systems, that's enough to know. Data is used to reward the model for giving correct outputs and punish it for giving the wrong outputs. And the more data that you have, the more trained the model gets. Again, this is a lot like the dog. We're going to go back to the dog. The thing is, you know, imagine the dog is like a, a model that hasn't been trained. It doesn't know how to target. You stick out your fist, it might do whatever. It could do anything. And as you train it, it gets better and better at targeting. Slowly, slowly, you know, you introduce a stimulus and every time you reward it, it gets better and it learns. And that's kind of exactly how it works with um, neural networks. You introduce a stimulus, i.e. you give it an input, and you reward the good behavior, and then it always, slowly, slowly, it gets better and better. So again, when people talk to you about training neural networks, just think about this guy, okay? This is what you want to think about. This is the neural network right here. This is the artificial intelligence. This is how it works. Oh, input, that's an input. Oh, and that's the output. Oh, was it correct? Yes, it was correct. Good neural network. That's how it works, okay? This is how training artificial intelligences work. Right, stimulus, input, architecture, dog, output, um, what it does in response. Okay, so now we're gonna get a little bit more technical because I know that people like getting into the weeds in this class, which is actually great. I love the people asking these questions. A training data set is usually what we use to train the model. Uh, we, we call the training data set. And all a training data set is, um, it's a whole bunch of data points. And all a data point is, is an input and the correct or like expected output. That's all a data set is. In this case, we have a very small data set. How many data points in this data set, guys? How many data points? Hey, Casalia! Again, Casalia just smashing it out. Who? 
That's correct. There are two data points in this data set. Tiny little training data set we have here. Um, one input, which is Ed Sheeran, and the correct output, yes. One output input is uh, Jack Hugh Jackman. <laughs> and I have output... red hair, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> I just, yeah, sorry, too many Jacks, too many Jacks around. Uh, uh, Hugh Jackman and the output is no. So this is a tiny data set. Um, and the idea is that just the way that you train is you, you take for every data set, data point in your data set, you pick, the, pick it, okay, we'll pick the first one. You choose a data point from the data set, pass the input to the model, and then you reward the correct output. So you compare the model's output to the ground truth. So this is, this is the fancy name that we give to the correct output. We call the correct one the ground truth because it's like the truth kind of. Um, compare the model's output to the ground truth for that particular data point. If they match, update the model to be more correct next time. If they don't match, update the model to be less wrong next time. Someone said huge Ackman. Who said that? Who is that? That was me. I only oh, was... sent it to hosts and panelists. <laughs> Other people weren't supposed to know. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's why it looked a bit special. Okay. Anyhow, um, so do we have any questions about that so far? Actually, you know what? No, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. I'll just go through this and then we'll do some questions about training and training data because this is really important. Training is very central to how we, we make AI systems. So if the update is correct, and again, we're going to get pretty deep in here, so this is hard to understand, don't worry. If the update is correct, if the output is the correct output, right? So we passed in Ed Sheeran, it said, yes, that's correct. We update every parameter. So that's every single one of these guys, which remember it contains a little number. Each one of these is like a little number. And the number talks, you know, it sort of, it's, it allows signal to pass through or it prevents signal from passing through. So you take every parameter um, and you update it so that next time we got, if we were given the same input again, we'd get the same output again, right? So you pass in an input, it gives you the correct output. You take every parameter, update it slightly so that if it had the same input again, it would give you the same output. And then if the output is incorrect, so you pass in Ed Sheeran, it says no, no red hair. Then you update every parameter so that next time it would do the opposite of what it would or what it did that time. So that, you know, you pass it in tons and tons and tons and tons of images. And eventually it's sort of, because you're updating the, these numbers, eventually the numbers fall into a sort of an alignment such that they always seem to give the correct output um, when they're given the correct input. Don't worry too much about that. Again, if you wanna know more, I linked that YouTube video. That's sort of all you need to know, right? You give an input, if it gives the correct output, you reward it. Wrong, punish it. So this is an example of us passing in this particular input and it giving the wrong answer, the answer that does not match the ground truth. Okay, and again, um, <clears throat> yeah, and again, I just, just one more time, you know, we're just gonna watch that dog video. I almost, I almost pressed control H to show the history of my browser, but I didn't. So we don't need to think about what would have happened otherwise. This is what's happening. This is the neural network and you reward its good behavior. And now there's no input, there's no input, does nothing. Oh, that's an input. Oh, no reward, no reward. Ah, oh, no, we rewarded that one. So that's, that's, how, that's how training works for neural networks. Now, does anyone have any questions? There are several questions. I would like to also just request that people please refrain from asking questions about wigs and hair dye. It's what? There are there are a lot of questions. People want to know what if somebody dyes their hair and what if somebody's wearing a wig. And I just think that you might be missing the point a little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, in that, and I think also the answer to that, once again, Luca, correct me if I'm wrong, would be to feed it more inputs and correct it if it is uh, incorrect. Train it based on the same training principles that you have provided us with, but based on real or fake redheads, so that then can. Uh, be reinforced. Um, yes. And 
We've got a question about uh, thoughts on reinforcement learning from human feedback, RLHF. Is that what you're talking about in terms of training, punishment, or rewarding? Listen, guys, we are not going to cover RLHF in this course. <laughs> it is too complicated. <laughs> okay, it's actually not that complicated, but it goes beyond the scope of this course. So I apologize. We're not going to go into that. Not a problem. Uh We've got uh, questions about, okay, um, I'm going to say we're going to keep going for time, actually. Okay. There okay, are a number cool. of questions. Apologies to everybody that hasn't had their questions answered. Once again, direct you to the forums at learn.itmasters.edu.au. Thank you. Someone says, is there another course coming? Hmm. Is there? Is there, Jack? What do you think? Yes, there is. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, okay. And now we're going to talk about overfitting. This is something that's very common. So I want you to, this is a question I want to ask everyone. Give us some answers here, guys. Ah! What would happen if you had a data set with just one data point in it? Okay, this is what the data set looks like. Just the one, just this first one. And you trained your model on that one data point like a thousand, let's say you trade a million times, you pass in the data point, it gives an output. And if it says yes, you reward it. And if it says no, you punish it. What kind of, what kind of thing would happen? Some people are saying nothing, but it's not quite nothing. Okay, so let's say you've done this, right? You're passing this one model and you've always punished it whenever it said no, and you've always rewarded it when it said yes. What would happen when you passed in another image? What would it say? Yes, people are saying yes. People are saying wouldn't be able to recognize it, incomplete. The thing is, what's likely going to happen? Because it's only ever seen one kind of thing. It's only ever, it's only ever been taught to say yes. It'll just start saying yes to everything. Because only has been trained on this one data point. So it'll just, it'll just learn that yes is all it's supposed to do. Yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, it's like if you gave a dog a treat, no matter what it did. If you're just constantly giving your dog treats, then it'll, it'll, it won't learn how to do anything. <laughs> it's kind of similar to that. So um, this is a problem called overfitting, which is if you have a training data set, which is too small and doesn't represent the whole, um, uh, doesn't represent what you're going to see in production. Um, and the idea is the model is really clever. And it learns how to pass every time for every single data point in your data set. In this case, just one. And then um, when you deploy, deploy it to production, it, it just, it, it doesn't um, give you the correct answers because it's just learned how to do this one small thing. Um, yeah, so you can think of overfitting. It's just, imagine just one image. You just pass in one input and, it, and it'll always just give the same output. Okay, that's another thing that comes up a lot in data science. Okay, great. So we've actually, we've, um, we've gone ahead and we've done a lot this lesson, you know. We, we went ahead and designed some tests. Um, actually, I guess first we, we worked out what the problem was and we described it using a three-part model. Then we designed some tests. Then we worked out what some good tests were and we, we figured out a pretty good test we could use. Then after that, we talked about training and we worked out what a good training data set would look like. Oh, actually, now we're about to look at what a good training data set would look like. So um, if I have 10,000 images, of redhead celebrities, is that a good training data set? What do you think, guys? Yes or no? No. People are saying no. People are saying yes. Jack, why is it not a good data set? Uh, I believe there is some objection to the idea that it's only being trained on celebrities. Yep. That's one reason it's bad. Uh, and somebody also said it doesn't cover negatives. Yes, exactly. That's the other very big thing. Because if you just train on redhead people, it has no idea what non-redhead people look like. Okay, how about 2,000 2, images of celebrities taken on the internet? Half red, half not. We already sort of covered that. You know, the images of celebrities on the internet, they're probably going to be different from what we're looking at in real life. How about 743 images taken with the same camera as the production camera, and 102 have red hair, and 641 have non-red hair? This is a bit of a weird one. Just say one, one good thing or one bad thing about this. 
Um, yeah, that's open to Jack and the chat. Well, uh, someone who says the same camera, but someone has also said that may have the same faults. Yes, so the same camera is good. You know, the more that your training data is like the data you're going to meet in real life, the better. Um, yeah, someone, Ben Harmer, very cleverly pointed out, there's sort of a bias here. So there's way more pictures of non-redhead people than redhead people in this data set. So, you know, maybe the computer will learn to say no all the time, or it'll say no almost all the time. And it, it won't really learn to say yes very much. So that could be one issue. How about this next one? 1,700 images taken with the production camera, so it's the same camera, of urban scenery. So just urban scenery, not even like people, just like pictures of, you know, just like buildings and stuff, plus 300 photos of redhead people doing passport photo shots. What do we think? Is this good or bad? I would say it's inconsistent and therefore probably not adequate as a training set. Yeah. And why is it inconsistent? What's where's the inconsistency? Well, the only uh, pictures of people are going to be red-haired people, so there's potential uh, positive bias in that direction, and the other uh, images are just extraneous. Nice. Nice. Very good. Um, and not only that, there are also red-haired people doing photo passport photo shoots, which that's probably not going to look like our camera, probably. Um, one thing that is kind of interesting about this one, though, is that, like, you know, in our scenario, we have a camera that's facing out of a door looking at people. Sometimes there's going to be no one standing there. There's just going to be the street. So, you know, maybe it would be good to teach it, you know, not to open when it's just looking at the street. That's probably, that's probably something that would be good. But obviously you do, as Jack pointed out, you do need some pictures of people who aren't redhead as well. Otherwise, it'll probably just say, oh, that's a person. I'll open what about all of the above just rolled into one huge data set? <laughs> now, that's a complicated, that's a complicated, someone said yo, and that's about as good of an answer as I can give. <laughs> bit of yes, bit of no. There are sort of a lot of images, um, but in a way there's sort of a, there's something kind of nice about just taking all of this data and using all of it as your training set, because it, this kind of gives it a bit of variety. It sees some passport photos. It sees some celebrity. It sees some people from the street. It sees some pictures of the street without people. In a way, there's some good things about having a big data set, but there are also there are also sort of a lot of issues. It's probably going to be very imbalanced. You know, it might it might learn some things wrong because it's just a higgledy piggledy mush of data. Okay, so these are some examples of training data sets. The main thing to take away from this, okay, just Put your remembering hats on here for a second. Main thing to take away from this, training data sets should be as big as possible. You want a big, chunky, chunky training data set. It should be as close to the production data as possible, and it should be as diverse as possible, you know, in all different kinds of lighting conditions, people with wigs, all of that good stuff, all that stuff Dave was talking about before. Think of all the edge cases, the things that are likely to trick the model, the things that would trick a human. Try to put them all in there. <laughs> Kids just ask everyone, do you wear wigs? This is an important question. Will you wear oh. wigs? <laughs> when will you wear wigs? I, I don't wear a wig yet, but I may. I may in future. I've got one for you. You have a wig? That's yeah. Very, that's very kind and generous. Thank you, Jack. Not a problem. <laughs> um. Yeah, train data sets, make them big and make them similar as you can to the, um, to the images you're going to find in production. A really good example, a really good example of what data scientists do is they'll collect like, I don't know, um, they'll collect data from production and then split it. They'll split it like 80-20 and they'll use 80% for training and the last 20% for testing. That's like the perfect example. So like, yeah, that, that, that's the idea is sometimes you can actually take data that is production data already. Like for example, let's say that this system's actually been running for like a year, the camera has been there for a year and people have been opening and closing the door. Um, so you know which people got let in, which people didn't. And that way you already have data that is production data and you can use that and say, here are all the, late, the, the images associated with people who got let in here are the images associated with people who 
got kicked out. And you can use that as a training data set. Okay. So hopefully we've kind of learned about training data sets. Um, do we have time for like maybe one, one quick question or something? Well, we, we do. However, we, we, we would theoretically, however, um, I did close the Q&A for time reasons. Yep. So okay, it may okay, have been okay. too efficient. Yeah. Okay. 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 So let's just talk about deployment. Deployment is the final bit of the data science workflow. It's the final thing about AI. And deployment is about where does the model actually end up sitting? So we've built the model. You know, it's, it's sitting in our hands. Andre Karpathy has gone and trained it. He's given it to us. Now we actually have to plonk it inside the door. You know, we have to put it inside the system so it actually starts working. Deployment, really difficult and hard. And a lot of it is sort of more traditional software engineering stuff as opposed to AI data science -y stuff. Okay, so in our case, we've got the model. And here's an example of how we could deploy it. You have the camera. You have the, the computer, the camera passes images to the computer. You have your neural network you've just trained sitting on the computer. And the computer passes in the image. The neural network gives it an answer, yes or no. And if it says yes, it opens the door. If it says no, it doesn't open the door. That's deployment option number one. Here's deployment option number two. Maybe you get the model and you realize that it's too big. It's too big to run on the computer. It's this computer that's sitting behind the door. It's just too small. It's too old. So what you do is you, um, you get another big computer, and then you put that on the internet somewhere, and then you get the camera to pass an image. And every time the camera passes an image to the small computer, it sends the image to the big computer, which sends it to the neural network, which gives an answer, which it sends back. And then we open or close the door like this. So here are the two deployments. Which one do you think is better? Everyone's saying the second. Why the hell is everyone saying the second? Can anyone give me one good reason why the second is good? Someone says context, question mark, question mark. That's fair. We don't Someone said context. one for speed. One for speed, right? This seems like it's it would probably be faster because you don't have to do a request over the internet. Why is everyone saying two, Jack? What's going on there? Oh, there are a lot of uh, suggestions <laughs> for uh, more data, uh, larger data sets. Uh, the first is better provided there is enough computing power. Uh, failure of internet means no door. It's another that's, one. That's correct. Failure of internet. Two means for no accuracy. Door. Uh, too expensive. Let me, well. let me actually, let me just put a pin in that one, right? Two for accuracy. Um, it's the same model. So it doesn't matter where the model is it's just going to be exactly as accurate. So the bigger computer doesn't make it more accurate. I just want to make that very clear. This is actually very important. The model and the computer are separate and you can run the same model on any kind of computer and it would work the same. So that's really important. Okay, and other people are coming up with good suggestions as well, like the second is more scalable. You know, maybe you could have this one computer and you could have it servicing eight doors, you know. Maybe you could work like that. So these are the kind of questions we think about when we're deploying. Um, how much does it cost to run the model when you're actually running it? How quickly does the model respond to inputs? Is it going to be really hard to redeploy the model if it needs fixing? How do we know if the model is still working? These are the kind of questions that machine learning engineers usually have to deal with. That's their role. That's what machine learning engineers do. They deal with the deployment. OK, so for example, um, yeah, let's just go through a few things. Uh, which of these probably costs more? Is it two or one? What do we think? Which costs more, two or one? Two, everyone's saying two, and that's correct. Because in number one, uh, the model is just sitting there on the computer that's running, I don't know, it's sitting in like a shelf behind this door somewhere. And, you know, uh, it's just running, it's just consuming power, that's all. Uh, with number, oop, number one, oh, sorry, ah! <laughs> number one, you have to buy this other bigger computer and you have to maintain an internet connection, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of extraneous things. So the cost, this costs a bit more, number two. Okay, how quickly does the model respond to inputs? Which is quicker of these two? We sort of already went over this. Yep, everyone's saying one, everyone's saying one. That's correct because we don't have to do the internet. It just happens on the small computer. Um, if the input was really big, 
then this computer might be too slow, um, in which case it might be quicker to actually go past the internet. So for instance, chat GPT is so huge that if you tried to run it on your computer, it would be really slow. It's actually quicker to run it over in America on a big computer than it is to run it on your computer. That's how big chat GPT is. But in this case, all we're doing is reading in a single image. So that, that's a pretty small thing. You'll be able to do this on a consumer grade computer. Okay. Um, how hard is it going to be for the model to, to redeploy the model if you have to improve it? So let's say it's been running for a month and a half, and then suddenly it just starts letting in everyone, right? And you're like, oh gosh, okay, now I need to fix the model. Which of these two is going to be easier to fix? One or two? Bit of mixed messaging here. I guess it's not 100% clear from the context which is going to be easy to fix, but you can definitely see how two might be easier to fix, right? You've got a technician. And in case number one, the technician actually has to physically walk with like a USB. He has to walk to the hideout, get in somehow. Maybe he doesn't have red hair, so he'll have trouble. He has to get in and plug his USB in and change the model over. And then, okay, right, done. He can leave, get in his car and, and drive off. Whereas the number two, maybe the computer is sitting inside the technician's house. He'd have to wear a wig. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to hire a wig. You know, there's all this nonsense to it. But if, if we have number two, maybe the computer's sitting inside his house or maybe it's the computer's being managed by someone else. Uh, and then you can just log into the computer online and you can just switch out the model. And that might be a lot easier of a process. Okay, and finally, how do we know if the model is still working? This is an interesting question. So what happens is you receive an email, you're the people who built the model, you receive an email from the Redhead Society saying, oh, hey, hey guys, um, last week, the door let in Bob who has black hair. And you receive that email. And you're sitting there being like, okay, what do I do? Has the model fallen over? Has the computer crashed? What's going on? Because in deployment number one, at least, you don't actually know. You don't actually know. Someone said Bob had a wig on. <laughs> you don't actually know what's going on here. The computer could have crashed for all you know. Maybe the model is actually not working. Maybe what actually happened is that like Bob um, was wearing a wig or he's like a strawberry blonde person who kind of looks like he's got red hair. There's a lot of possibilities and you won't know until you actually physically open up the computer and see what happened. Whereas in number two, since we have internet connection, you can just log, you know, you can have a huge data set of all the, you know, maybe the last 10 days worth of people who got let in. And that way you can actually look at the images yourself and see exactly what happened. And you can log, oh, you know, was the model running? Was the model not running? You can understand all these things. So um, from the perspective of deployment, there are a few advantages to going with number two. Uh, and these are the kind of trade-offs and the questions that machine learning engineers ask themselves. Okay, my voice is dying. I'm dying. Um, we're nearly at the end of this. Um, just another fun, just another fun idea is you could have deployment number three, where you put the model directly onto the camera. Because the camera's, you know, it's got some sort of computer infrastructure in there. If the model is so small and tiny, maybe you can just plonk it directly in there. And of course, that'll make it even harder to get at because, you know, it's sitting on a camera. You can't really, it's very hard to debug code that's sitting on a camera. Anyhow, there are all sorts of ideas, different ways you can deploy things. Okay, so this is what we learned. This is what we talked about this lesson is building and deploying artificial intelligences. This is kind of the process that AI practitioners go through when they build AI systems. You sort of have this design phase, right? Where you choose your task or you identify the task. And hopefully this is something that you'll be able to go through as well after completing this course and doing the tests. Um, choose a task, identify the inputs and outputs, choose an architecture. So this here is applying the three-part model. And then you acquire some training and testing data and design some tests. And this is sort of the designing, sort of the design things that you need to do. And then you have your sort of big three, right? Once you've done your designing, you train, and then you test. And if you fail the test, you train again. And if you fail the test, you train again, and you keep doing that. And once you pass the test, boom, you deploy. 
And so that's kind of the machine learning workflow, um, the workflow for building AI systems. Hopefully, hopefully you guys kind of understand all this a bit. Can I, can I get some idea in the chat? Like, like, does this all kind of make sense? Do you feel like maybe you could, you yourself could go through this and maybe like sketch this out yourself? We've got a cascade of yeses. One nice. or two no's. We've got a few no's, <laughs> but a lot of yeses. Look, look, I'm happy with that ratio. I'm very happy with that ratio. How about you, Jack? Oh, I'm, I'm thrilled with this ratio. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> and I also would like to just remind everybody that all of the recordings and the slides for previous weeks are available uh, on the uh, Moodle, which is at learn.itmasters.edu.au. So perhaps a little refresher might help you out. Mm, mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, yeah, rewatching things is good. And so is doing the tests. <laughs> okay, this is what I went through this time. And I just wanna, you know, I just wanna leave you again with my favorite thing that I've discovered. Just, just this video, man. This is what artificial intelligence is. This is what we do. <laughs> this is what data scientists do all day. <laughs> Who's a good artificial intelligence? <laughs> This is what the job is. <laughs> it's a lot less fun though. It's a lot less fun when your dog is inside of a computer and you can only feed it images. Okay, that's about it. Um, uh, Jack, I feel like I've, I've come to the end. I've come to the end here. Do you want to take it from here? Absolutely. Well, you've come to the end of this week's. We will be returning once again, same time, same place. That is 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, next Thursday as well. So wherever you are in the world, same time, same place next week. Uh, we've got one final uh, webinar of this short course. And because we've now gone through the majority of the course, it's survey time. So for those of you who have previously taken an ITM short course, uh, you'll know that we send out surveys or we make surveys available via the Moodle uh, at week three. So please give us uh, all of the feedback uh, that you would like to give us to help improve the short course experience for the future as well. As a few quick questions, Kit has dropped the link specifically to the quiz in the chat as well. Please, uh, as Lua ha Luca has uh, requested, take the quizzes that have been uploaded to the Moodle as well. Uh, and that learn.itmasters.edu.au is also where you can find all of the course materials. So those are quizzes, they're forums where you can ask all of the questions that were not able to be answered tonight. Apologies for time reasons um, and also several for wig reasons. Um, and uh, you can discuss wigs and hair dye to your heart's content as well as uh, training and reviewing the training processes for AIs. Uh, and that's learn.itmasters.edu.au. Uh, thank you very much to Kit, who has been working tirelessly in the background, making sure everything runs smoothly for us. Thank you, everybody thank you, who thank was you, so great in the chat and in the questions this evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, Kit is ironically allergic to cats. Did not know that. <laughs> we'll keep that in mind. Uh, and thank you very much to Luca for a fantastic and engaging session Hopefully we will see you back same mm. time and place next week where Luca will be possibly wearing a red wig. We'll find out. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm going to email you about it right now, Luca. <laughs> Remember, go, go to the Moodle and fill out this thing and then we'll choose a cool one next week and we'll all do it together. Excellent. All right. Thank you, everybody. That is the end of this session today. See you same time, same place next week. Thanks very much. Bye.